There are more people in the world now than there ever have been. That's been true every day since the Black Death occurred in the Middle Ages. And as the population grows, the number of resources available to everyone is decreasing. What this has resulted in, in a lot of ways, is a lot of different uh, kinds of displaced people, people who are forced out of their homes due to conflicts, resource shortages, or just any reason that makes their living situation untenable. There are lots of different kinds of displaced people. They all have different experiences, they all have different definitions, uh, and there's a couple of them specifically that I want to talk about today and focus on with my thesis a little bit. These are some of the groups that my thesis is touching on, not necessarily focusing on, but different kinds of refugees and different kinds of environmental migrants. So we're going to come back to this, uh, but this is just some of the causes of displacement that people experience and what they need in order to return to their homes. The ones that I want to focus on first are the refugees. And there are three kinds of refugees, uh, which I'll expand on in a moment, um, but they are forced out of their homes by conflict. So what is a refugee? definition from the UN is that a refugee is a person who, owing to well-founded fear of being persecuted for reasons of race, religion, nationality, membership of a particular social group or political opinion, is outside the country of his or her nationality and is unable or un owing to such fear is unwilling to avail him or herself of the protection of that country or who, not having a nationality and being outside the country of his or her formal habitual residence as a result of such events, is unable or owing to such fear, unwilling to return to it. So essentially, it's people who cannot rely on the protection of their country or their community anymore and are forced to leave. There are three stages to this experience, according to Michael, Michelle, Hagier. First is the stage of destruction. This is the impetus for leaving. This is the stage of uh, war, um, deprivation, and chaos that causes people to flee their homes, which is followed by a stage of confinement. This is a time of waiting, usually spent in refugee camps or improvised settlements, which is a liminal space where people don't have a nationality, they don't have an identity necessarily, they can't rely on anyone for uh, protection, and they are forced to depend on the receiving state or receiving country for aid and sustenance. After a time of confinement, the moment of action is sort of the goal. This is when refugees begin searching for rights, for an identity, and for a voice. And this is kind of the area uh, between the stage of confinement and the moment of action that I want to focus on for my thesis. So, Michelle Aguirre says that refugees are at once victims, illegal, and defenseless, and we only need the survivors. So this is a group of people who have faced uh, greater challenges than most anyone else in the world, and uh, I believe that there's a great opportunity for design intervention here. So getting into the different kinds of refugees a little bit. The first are called situational refugees. So these are people living in country A, their home on the left, who are due, due to conflict between other groups caught in the crossfire, due to the chaos, uh, breakdown in infrastructure, or general lack of resources caused by this conflict. They're forced to leave to country B, the receiving state, where they uh, receive aid in some form. The second is persecuted refugees. These are groups who are specifically targeted by the people in their original country and are most forced to leave and seek aid from a receiving state. And the third is called a state in exile, which is the losing side of a civil war that is forced to flee and depend on another country for aid. They have different uh, features and needs depending on which kind of refugee they are. Um, state in exile refugees tend to have a higher propensity towards violence. Situational refugees have a very low propensity towards violence. They don't have as much political organization and they don't have as much of a voice as something like a state in exile would. But what they have in common is they often end up here in refugee camps. So I want to talk a little bit about what the experience of being in a refugee camp actually means. So what the UN calls minimal life under transfusion is what the receiving state is obligated to provide for its refugees, which includes security, food, and health. So these are the main goals of organizations that run and manage refugees, like the UN High Commission, right? UN High Commission on Refugees, is to provide these basic things to maintain a quality of life for its residents. So when the refugees arrive in a new country, what happens is they're no longer 
able to return to their home for an uh, indefinite period of time. And an organization like the UN High Commission on Refugees uh, is responsible for, takes on the responsibility of arriving in this country, setting up a camp, and placing the refugees in it. Uh, part of why this is done is to provide the aid for the refugees, but also it's seen to separate out uh, the people who are victims from the rest of the people who are natives of that country. A lot of the design of refugee camps focuses on separating refugees from the rest of the population. There are often tensions between local native populations and refugees because they see refugees as competing for jobs, uh, competing for resources, things like that. So the more people you're putting into a given place, the more likelihood there is of a conflict and tension breaking out if uh, these camps aren't uh, structured in a certain way. So different organizations provide the resources necessary to maintain the camps. Doctors Without Borders uh, provides a lot of the medical care. CARE provides a lot of the food. And then UNICEF and the World Food Program are responsible for the maintenance and construction of things like wells. So according to Hannah Arendt, what refugees need is fame. Uh, they often think that they don't have a voice. They often say, no one knows who I am. Uh, as part of that transition between the moment of confinement and the moment of action, giving refugees a voice is an important part of that shift. So focusing on the idea of refugees that no one knows who they are, I want to shift to a different sort of displaced person. These are uh, what I've been calling in other organizations call environmental migrants. So what is an environmental migrant, aka a climate refugee, as they're sometimes referred to, even though they don't fit the specific definition of refugee as it stands right now? So environmental migrants, according to the International Organization for Migration, are persons or groups of, uh, for compelling reasons of sudden or progressive changes in the environment that adversely affect their lives or living conditions or are obliged to leave their habitual homes or choose to do so either temporarily or permanently and who move either within their country or abroad. So some of the key differences here is refugees move outside of their country. Environmental migrants can move around within the same country because they aren't necessarily being persecuted or targeted. It's that the homes that they're used to have degraded to a point where they're no longer livable. So the first one we talked about is sudden changes. So this is what, are some, what is sometimes called a disaster victim. Uh, these are victims of things like hurricanes, like this is Hurricane Katrina, which causes massive and sudden damage to infrastructure and makes the habitat uninhabitable. Um, these things happen with little warning. Uh, they are temporary, but they cause large um, problems for the local communities and force people to leave. So the solutions to some of these problems are usually quick and improvised. There are organizations to take care of this, but many recent incidents have shown that they're not always necessarily entirely prepared. Uh, this is uh, the stadium in New Orleans where everyone leaving Hurricane Katrina had to find shelter for a period of time before they were moved to Houston. The second is progressive changes. So these are the environmental migrants or climate refugees. This is the result of uh, changes to the local environment due to things like climate change. So as the level of carbon dioxide in the atmosphere goes up, the temperature of the planet rises with it, which causes changes in ocean chemistry, uh, ocean volume, sea level rise, uh, generally just changes to how the Earth's ecosystem works, which makes changes to local environments, what kind of land is tenable, uh, what kind of land is traversable, uh, and causes problems for everyone living there. So this is projected sea level rise up until 2100. So this is a problem for a lot of coastal communities, like. Uh, Western Denmark and Germany, where the average height above sea level is less than a meter, and you have people farming the salt bogs, uh, the halligans they're called, on the border of Germany and Denmark. You also have problems in places like Alaska and the native populations that live on the islands off of the coast that are being eroded away to the point where people and houses have started falling in the ocean and beaches are washing away. They depend on the pack ice that comes every winter to to protect them from the storms that cause this kind of erosion. And since the temperatures have warmed, the pack ice doesn't form as early and the storms hit the islands harder. So they're being forced to choose whether or not they want to move to another island and only delay the inevitable or potentially sacrifice their culture and move to a big city in Alaska. Other places like Bangladesh have ocean water 
um, invading in on the delta where people previously had rice paddies. This raises the salinity of the water and forces people to close down the rice paddies and open shrimp plantations, which uh, don't employ as many people and are forcing a lot of the residents of Bangladesh to move into Dhaka, the capital, where it's getting more and more crowded and there aren't enough jobs for people. And this is Male, the capital of the Maldives. Average height is uh, one meter above sea level, and it's a huge city. So any change in sea level is going to affect hundreds of thousands of people who live here and the country as a whole as they have to make decisions about what to do with their culture. So what does the future hold? The climate refugee crisis I talked about here and the conflict refugee crisis really are only previews of the potential problems that will occur in the next 50 to 100 years. This is a graph from limits to growth showing uh, decreases in available food and resources uh, and industrial production, which results in a collapse of the population. Now, this will be a gradual collapse, likely, but not one without conflict or problems. As more and more people are competing for fewer and fewer resources, the likelihood of conflict breaking up gets bigger and bigger. And as the uh, effects of climate change grow stronger and stronger, the align between environmental refugees or environmental migrants and conflict refugees will start to blur as the two problems start to uh, coincide with one another. So this is just kind of illustrating as there are more people and fewer resources, problems begin to arise as people compete for tenable lands, uh, available mineral rights, just essentially anything where uh, you have more people than you have available resources. So where I want my thesis to live, the solution area that I want to focus on, is here in this orange area. This is the space between the amount of people that are living in a given space and the amount of resources available in that space. Ideally, leveling off resource consumption, being more efficient with what's available for the people who are forced to use it, and potentially uh, assisting a rebound in human population in a more sustainable way. So are there solutions to this? What kinds of solutions are available? Uh, I think one area that is uh, worth looking at is some place like Mongolia, where nomadic civilizations have been living uh, for thousands of years and have developed a culture that is not dependent on a specific place, but can live on the move. Uh, so my intent is to travel to Mongolia starting December 15th uh, to spend some time living with a family in Mongolia and observing the strategies they've developed day to day in order to meet the challenges they face living in a place with few resources and harsh conditions. So the questions I have going into this is how can we draw upon a rich cultural memory to address the needs of the present? There, these strategies have been developed over thousands of years and if they can be applied to populations that have been forced to live on the move or forced to live in tent shelters away from their homes, there's a design opportunity there. What is the relationship between nomads and their environment? Like I said, they've been there for thousands of years and the resources of the area are still there. How, what strategies do they have for interacting with the natural world that could be applied to uh, some place like a refugee camp? And what have they created to meet the challenges of everyday life? What are the simple solutions, the little hacked objects, the artifacts of everyday life there that could be inspiration for a product design of some kind, potentially? So what's the plan going forward? So this is uh, the time we have left. This is us now at Hurricane Matthew. Uh, so the final fall presentation will be at the end of the quarter. Followed by that in December is my trip to Mongolia. Over the course of winter quarter, I want to use that time to ideate uh, come up with concepts, sort of refine uh, what ideas are available based on what I've learned in my secondary research and the trip to Mongolia, and ideally prototype it and test it with uh, an actual refugee camp, if I could set that up. Um, that's potentially a long shot at this point, but the Mongolia trip was a long shot too at one point, so I'm optimistic we can make that work. Uh, and then spring midterms, thesis defense, a little bit after midterm in spring quarter, uh, so that we can have Greg here to speak, and then graduation. So that's the plan going forward. So next steps. There are different areas of the refugee experience that I can focus on, and uh, we don't have to decide on what to focus in on yet, but I want to explore sort of three different levels. The first is basic 
product design level stuff. My background is in industrial design. Um, not drawing on that skill set seems like it would be uh, not necessarily prudent to, to not draw on that in some way. So focusing on infrastructure, artifacts, and shelters is an opportunity for design in a place like a refugee camp. A little bit higher levels, organization, economy, and safety. A lot of the problems that are uh, faced by refugees involve not being able to be economically independent while they're living in the camp. They're often not allowed to work in the countries that are receiving them. And uh, developing something that could fuel an economy within a refugee camp could be a uh, another design opportunity. But the higher level stuff, when I talk about that moment of action and getting a voice and rights, is uh, focusing on identity, focusing on preserving culture independent of place, and focusing on giving refugees a voice. So this is more abstract, but is also potentially more effective. And I want to know from you guys in the committee, given the time available, if that's a realistic goal. Uh, because I think it would be the ideal place to, to insert some design intervention of some kind. So a lot of this is based on some current assumptions, which are not necessarily true, but I've been operating on these as being true for the moment. One is the experiences of future displaced peoples, displaced by climate change and climate-related conflicts, will be similar enough that those to modern refugees is to make this research valuable. I'm operating under the assumption, essentially, that by studying the refugee experience now, I can work to design solutions that will help refugees or climate migrants in the future. The second assumption is that the strategies that nomadic cultures have developed can be a source of design inspiration to address the needs of current or future refugees. Essentially, that there's information that will be valuable in Mongolia that I'm going to find is, at this point, an assumption based on some secondary research, but it's still essentially an assumption. And the questions I have for you are, what are the areas of the refugee experience that represent pain points that can be made into actionable design opportunities? This is one of the things I'm researching and trying to find out more information about, and any feedback from you would be helpful. And also, should design solutions focus on addressing the needs of displaced peoples in the present, or an attempt to anticipate the needs of the future? This is essentially, should I be focusing on people who are refugees now, or should I be working towards, like I talked about earlier, the potential for refugee needs in the future? So. That's where we're at now. If we want to open it up to discussion, I think that would be great. Mm -hmm. Okay, great. Thank you. All right.